people says you have great concern and sensitivity for the future of the country and the people. But let's start from the beginning. Four months ago, you resigned from the government of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. Why did you do that? Well, I saw Ethiopian uh, system of governance is not reformable within. So I had to step out and I had to speak out, even though I was speaking. Um, and I've been very vocal from the beginning, but I had to do it from outside the government. Why do you say it was not reformable? That is a very strong statement. Well, we had, we had all the promises and the hopes. We had a young African rising prime minister with, with the hope of bringing new beginnings. And all those uh, hopes were dashed. You were the first federal official, a senior government official, to say conclusively that rape was used as a weapon of war in the Tigray conflict. But that was in a tweet. It didn't come in an official government report. There was no press release. Why did you do this in almost like in a personal capacity? I, I think I've explained a little bit on my Washington interview the reasons behind why I had to do it on my personal Twitter, which was a uh, all the pressures coming from the government and the PP, or the Pro Prosperity Party, to put the lead on or to cover up. So I had to use any means that I can come out and speak to the Ethiopian people as well as other uh, stakeholders. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed went to the front lines to lead the fight against the Tigray People's Liberation Front. You say in your open letter to the Ethiopian people that this is a man who has a Nobel Peace Prize in one hand and a gun in the other. As somebody who was in his government, what do you make of his handling of the situation? He's, he's obviously mishandled this whole situation in the country. And we were not expecting to be in this situation to begin with. So we have a prime minister who's holding a Nobel Peace Prize and a gun in the other, and the population is so polarized and divided. And the division among groups is beyond uh, with a deep-rooted issues. So on top of that, like I've said, we have a man who was supposed to lead the country out of, the pro out of all the problems that we had yet we regressed back and we are in this situation. And there's no way, uh, I don't believe the prime minister has the capacity to bring the people out of this. And of course, I've, I would repeat saying that we are a free fall of a, a one man hubris and a one man provado and narcissism that has brought and le led us to this mess. I have covered Ethiopia extensively. This is a very divisive subject. There are people who will call you a liar for even speaking out. So why are you doing this? Well, I'm someone who was in the government. I'm someone who has been very vocal from the beginning. I, I spoke when the, when the war broke at first, 3rd of November. I wrote and I have put statements out there saying for everyone there has to be, there has to be the civilians has to be the utmost uh, prioritization of this conflict. We have to make sure women, children, and the infirm are protected in this conflict. So we have to speak regardless of what people are going to call us or shame us or name us for. We have to speak when we see injustice. And that is what I'm trying to do. The United Nations Human Rights Commission, lots of other independent bodies have put out reports that say all sides have committed atrocities in this conflict, that people have been misused in this conflict. Do you think things have changed since you left government? No, I don't think, I don't think much has changed. Yes, we see uh, the prisoners are coming out. We see um, the country is trying to lift its emergency state, but there's so much uh, humanitarian crisis unfolding. We've got the drought, we've got the looming famine, we've got the seas of uh, a whole region more than a year, and we have a generation of young people traumatized, raped, women raped. So no, I don't.
The African Union, the UN, the US, lots of other international partners are trying to mediate between the TPLF and the Ethiopian government. What do you want the international community to know about the situation in Ethiopia? Abiy cannot be the referee and the player at the same time on the field. They need to understand there has to be uh, a sequence prior to the negotiations that he proposed. There has to be a ceasefire prior to all of this, a cessation of hostility. There has to be a way forward to putting immediate humanitarian actions in place for regions that are at most risk of facing famine, facing medical issues. So I believe the international has a task to play, a role to play in this. And I know that many countries and international have been putting forward pressures, but they need to push more and they need to find a way for the country to heal. It's a time for the country where we need to move to a position of healing. And I don't think the prime minister is ready to do that. I don't think the prime minister is the right person to do that. Yes, though, I believe the prime minister should compromise as the head of the nation, as the prime minister of the country. He should compromise. He should put the people at first, and he needs to act accordingly. He needs to come to his sense. The situation looks bleak in Ethiopia. What do you think in your mind is the future? What is the way forward out of this conflict that has been raging for 15 months? I want to send a message to the African Union, who's been irrelevant in this conflict. I believe the African um, summit is taking place in February. I hope when African countries come together that they will put forward a pressure as countries to say there's a, there needs to be a cessation of hostility, there has to be a ceasefire, and that their summit can put some pressure in the government as well as other active agents in this uh, conflict. Felsen Ahmed Abdullahi, thank you for talking to us here on CNN. Thank you, Larry.